Hey, welcome to the Gentle Rebel podcast where we talk about navigating life's harsher edges with a spirit of compassionate creativity. I'm Andy Mort, I'm a songwriter and creativity coach and I love exploring the power of gentleness in creating conditions for meaningful change from the inside out. In this episode, I want to think about deep processing. What does it mean when we talk about highly sensitive people processing deeply? What happens when we can't process things deeply or we don't have the space and the time to process things deeply and how do we create conditions for deep processing both as something we actively do uh, at a conscious level and something that we kind of get out of the way of so it can happen um, at an unconscious or subconscious level deep processing isn't by definition the same as slow processing while it might sometimes take us longer to make conscious decisions and take action if there is a, a lot of stuff going on or a lot of new information to take in and weigh up. Um, if we have regular time, space and um, kind of healthy and helpful conditions for underground deep processing, we can actually process and respond to things with quick wit, intuitive awareness and fast reflexes. Uh, we might make faster decisions even and know what to do without a second thought. And this is what I want to talk about. Um, in this episode, you know, how can we create more uh, habits and conditions for deep processing in everyday life, not just for highly sensitive people, but for all of us individually and collectively. I want to think about how we absorb the unexpected changes that life throws our way uh, from time to time, inevitably, and without us um, being able to kind of predict and prepare for them. Um, So we're going to you know, think about how we do prepare to meet the challenges, losses and experiences that we are unprepared for. I want to start by sharing a story that I recently posted uh, on the website um, in uh, conjunction with the release of my song um, Tin Soldier. It's the tale of the steadfast tin soldier by Hans Christian Andersen. He was one of 25 forged from an old tin spoon and placed in a box given to a child on their birthday. All the soldiers looked the same except him. He was the last to be made and there was only enough tin to give him one leg. On his birthday, the child emptied the box and positioned the soldiers around his carefully crafted cardboard castle where a paper ballerina stood in the doorway. Her arms reached out and she stood on one leg in a pirouette. Her other leg was so high that the tin soldier couldn't see it. He assumed she was just like him. Amazed by her balance and poise, he admired her as he lay behind a box. He longed to know her and to live with her in the castle. He had a feeling that they belonged together. Even when the other soldiers were put away that evening and the rest of the toys played among themselves, the dancer and tin soldier remained utterly still. She held her arms to him and he remained steadfast, gazing at her as he stood on his one leg. Soon there was a startling bang. A jack-in-the-box sprung from the container next to him. Keep your eyes to yourself, tin soldier, came a voice that he pretended to ignore. Just you wait until tomorrow, the jack in the box continued in a somewhat threatening manner. The following day, one of the children put the tin soldier on the window ledge, but a sudden gust of wind caused the window to open. He fell out, landing on the pavement below. The child ran down to look, but didn't see him lying there despite nearly stepping on him. He could have called out, but the tin soldier had been taught to remain stoic and that drawing attention to yourself is inappropriate. Before long, it started to rain heavily, so the child gave up looking for him. After the rain had cleared, a few neighbourhood kids played outside on the street and noticed the tin soldier lying on the ground. They thought it would be fun to make a boat out of newspaper, place the soldier in it and send him sailing along the fast-flowing gutter. The high water level created waves, causing the paper boat to swirl and bounce. The steadfast tin soldier's head was spinning, but he didn't flinch. He kept his eyes to the front, wondering where he was going as the boat disappeared into a dark sewer. A giant water rat appeared and demanded the tin soldier hand over his passport. The soldier remained quiet as the paper boat rushed on, carried by the fast-flowing current. Despite the rat's protestations, he couldn't keep up with the tin soldier who left him in his wake. A light appeared in the tunnel ahead, but as it grew more prominent, so did the noisy roar. The crescendo was coming from a point at which the gutter poured like a waterfall into a grand canal below. There was no way to stop it, as the boat plunged into the whirlpool. It spun around and around, 
The tin soldier remained staunch and unblinking as he sunk deeper and deeper. He thought of the dancer, wishing he could see her again, but resigning himself to his inevitable fate. Eventually the boat broke and he fell right through it. Before he reached the bottom of the canal, however, he was swallowed by an enormous fish. This is where it ends, he thought, still staunch, still stoic. He was suddenly thrown about as the fish violently floundered and convulsed before it remained utterly still. After some time, the tin soldier noticed the flash of daylight. The fish had been caught and sold at the market. The person who bought it found the soldier when they cut the fish open to prepare it for dinner. Look who I just found, they said, placing him on a table. He was back in the bedroom. The same children, familiar toys, the castle. And there she was, the beautiful dancer, still on one leg, as steadfast as he. He wanted so much to cry, but he reminded himself that soldiers don't do that. So he fought off the tears. He looked at the ballerina and she looked at him. They didn't say a word. Suddenly one of the children grabbed the tin soldier and threw him into the fire for no apparent reason. There he stood, surrounded by flames, the heat excruciating. He wondered if the burning was from the fire or his love. The colour drained from his uniform and he felt himself melting. Still he stood steadfast, silently looking at the dancer as she silently looked at him. He watched as the bedroom door blew open and a gust of wind caught the dancer. It picked her up and took her right into the heart of the fire where she stood right next to him for a moment. And then she was gone. It didn't take long for the tin soldier to melt and his remains were found in the shape of a small tin heart the next day. All that was left of the dancer was her spangle, which was burned black and sitting on the tin heart. Um, maybe I should have warned you before that. It's quite a brutal uh, story. Um, and I don't, I don't really want to kind of interpret it in a, in a strict or concrete way, but rather just allow the themes from that story to germinate beneath the surface as we dive into this episode. What does that story have to do with deep processing, I hear you ask? Uh, I'm not entirely sure, uh, but I just have a sense that it's relevant in some way. Um, there, you know, there are, are themes like belonging and desire, drift, personal agency, responsibility, the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves and about why bad things happen to us, the stories we tell ourselves about other people and about what is right, proper and true, how we consciously process the things that happen to us through the scripts that we've learned to use as filters since childhood. What do we tell ourselves about ourselves? There's an old proverb that says that shallow rivers are noisy and deep lakes are silent. This is a picture that popped to mind when thinking about absorbing unexpected change in life. When things are thrown into life from outside like a a big rock, a great splash and disturbance occurs as it comes flying through the surface. After a while, the deep lake absorbs the rock into the landscape within the depths of the body of water. There's an unshakable power to the deep lake that can be both safe and terrifying. The shallow river, when flowing fast, is a noisy body of water. And when a big enough rock is thrown in, it can completely change the flow. Rather than absorbing it into its midst, it becomes a permanent feature visible to everybody on the outside. As rocks come in, they hit other rocks. They bounce in unpredictable directions and cause the water to spray every which way. And while there's sometimes something exciting about this kind of energy, It's also volatile. It's impossible to control. What about the tin soldier in relation to this image? Seems that he's been taught to stay silent, to be stoic. He doesn't react to what is happening. He's not proactive in changing his position in relation to the world around him. He dutifully and bravely, seemingly, gets on with it. We don't know what he really feels and needs in this story. We just know that he's not allowed to feel or need it. In a sense, he doesn't truly belong to the world he inhabits. He's not like the others, but he doesn't belong to himself. He just stares at the thing he longs for. 
He wonders where he's going to end up as he drifts down the sewer. He has the appearance of a deep lake, passively absorbing these terrible events and even telling himself a story of of why he might deserve this. But this approach doesn't actually create anything positive, anything meaningful for him. Absorbing the blow is one part, but for true integration to happen, we must also respond to it. This is where the change that happens outside of us fundamentally changes the inside of us in some way too. This is why I think gentleness is such a powerful thing to think about in this context. We hear the message that, you know, be firm, be unyielding in the face of adversity. But does that really help? Openness to yielding and flexibility actually allows us to recognise the things that maybe we can let go. Like the boxer rolling with the punches, you know the impact of a blow is less if you move with it until that force lessens. This flexibility requires a solid, firm foundation and rooting, a solid footing, the ability to move but to be balanced, to keep the whole thing stable. This is where I see this link between deep processing and gentleness. The depth provides foundations that allow us to pick the most appropriate course of action for the issue at hand. And gentleness is the openness, the awareness and the intuition to choose based on what we see in front of us rather than what we think we ought to do. What we apply from the message that we've taught ourselves to believe um, maybe throughout our lives so far. We can recognise patterns in how we respond to unexpected change. Preparing for the unexpected begins by raising awareness around these reflexes and scripts that we default to when the dreaded thing happens. How do you tend to to react? Think about the last time that you had some unexpected news or were involved in an unanticipated situation. What did you do? What was was your kind of reflexive um, reaction? What position did you assume in relation to other people around you, other people involved? Maybe you took charge. Maybe you looked to somebody else to take charge. Maybe you tackled the issue head on. Maybe you turned your back and ran from it. Or maybe you just froze, unable to do or think anything. Observe this situation without judgment. Understand that none of these reactions are right or wrong. They just are what they are. Then ask yourself how you would like to respond if you faced that same situation again tomorrow. If you had full control of your reactions in that experience, what would you have yourself do? And by the same token, when you think about that situation, what did you do in response to that that you wouldn't have done 10 years ago? In particular, identify ways that you've positively grown, positively changed in the way that you respond to change. Now, if you can't think of anything or you have a a view of your younger self as being able to deal with things much better than you can now, just allow that to sit with you as well. How do you know that is true? What is actually true about that for you? And what would you like to bring from that past you into the present you? In her book, You Don't Owe Anyone, Caroline Garnett McGraw tells uh, the story of what she describes as a cold bucket experience. She was in kindergarten doing her first dance recital with her class, performing in an auditorium full of parents. She talks about hearing the music, really feeling the music in her body and um, remembering that once that performance started, once the music started, it wasn't as scary as she anticipated. She really kind of entered the flow and enjoyed it, found it really fun. And at the end of the dance she says she was so taken by the energy of the moment that rather than pushing herself up from the floor like they'd rehearsed she wrapped her hands around the microphone stand pulled herself up and sang the final words of the song into the microphone she says um, that she was elated the audience were clapping and it just felt like this golden moment afterwards when she met up with her family caroline recalls her mum raising her eyebrows and saying Now, really, honey, I have to ask, what on earth were you doing with the microphone? You couldn't get up by yourself? She says her tone turned scolding and critical. Do you want people to think you had to use the stand to help you? It was just so melodramatic. 
She says she shook her head in dismay, then softened a little. Well, I guess you had to do it your way, huh? Maybe that sort of, yeah, brings, brings some kind of uh, memory of a, of a time in your own life when something like that happened. And, and Caroline describes moments like this as cold bucket being thrown over an experience, especially painful when it interrupts a moment where you thought you were doing okay, doing well even. This wave of shame pours over you with some words that hit right at the core of something vulnerable. And she says that she made herself a rule. She says, I would do whatever it took so that I'd never have to hear those words again. These kinds of experiences, similar to what might be described as small T traumas or paper cut traumas, when a need is not met in a particular moment and we feel disconnected and lonely, they feed the script that we write for our route into belonging and safety from a very young age. And without a bit of examination and space for processing, they become well-worn paths that we walk throughout our lives. In his book, The Myth of Normal, Gabor Mate describes trauma not as something that happens to you, but what happens inside you. It's a psychic injury lodged in our nervous system, mind and body. And I was reminded of Caroline's story when reading Mate's book because she describes something so normal and on the surface kind of mundane, everyday experiences that can leave a mark because what we need and what we receive in a particular moment don't align. Mate says this kind of small t trauma is almost universal. We all carry them, often from seemingly ordinary events. And this is why something can leave this kind of trauma for one person and not for someone else. So the cold bucket experience is not the event itself, but how we experience and hold the event, which is why it's rarely enough to undo the pain by explaining what was meant in the words, you know, if we've caused that pain or by rationalizing something. We might know even that that someone didn't mean to hurt us with their criticism. And we might forgive them for the words, but our experience of the words goes beyond the sound of them. It's about a need that we had in a particular moment, perhaps a need to matter, a need to express ourselves, a need for independence not being met, or in these situations, needs that get overlooked by the bucket of water. We might feel ashamed, embarrassed, scared, resentful, and so on. We don't want to feel those things. So over time, we learn to push down what we start to tell ourselves are unacceptable needs to have if we want to find safety and belonging. So I want to consider the impact of cold bucket experiences on the way that we feel about the possibilities, the way that we respond to change, and how we hold our relationships with other people. Cold bucket experiences might also come from what Winnicott referred to as nothing happening when something might have profitably happened. So moments when a need is not necessarily actively invalidated, but it is not met. Maybe we needed reassurance, acceptance or acknowledgement. Maybe we were ignored or forgotten about at a moment where we needed to be recognised in some way. Bessel uh, van der Kolk describes this kind of trauma being when we are not seen and known. And this speaks to the heart of belonging. These are words of unbelonging when our needs are unaccepted and unacceptable and our feelings are not empathized with by another person not necessarily deliberately but often because the other person isn't thinking about the impact of their words or their actions or their lack thereof this is common in a world that doesn't pause for a breath isn't it we all carry these kinds of wounds around as Mate says they're universal we often carry them around without realizing we see them displayed through symptoms in the way that we treat ourselves, we treat one another, and in the way that we try to soothe and nurse the wounds within. Mate says, when a wound doesn't mend on its own, one of two things happens. It remains raw, or it's replaced by a thick layer of scar tissue. The open sore is an ongoing source of pain and a place that can be hurt over and over by even the slightest stimulus. This compels us to be ever vigilant and alert to potential touch points. We're left nursing our wound and it leaves us inflexible and limited in our capacity to grow for fear of being harmed again. Scar tissue, he says, is preferable. It provides protection and holds tissues together, but it's tight, hard, inflexible, unable to grow 
and it's a zone of numbness. The original alive flesh has been replaced. This is what we carry with us in the form of these psychic injuries, the scripts we write as a way to ensure we never have to feel that way again. Both of these ways of holding our cold bucket experiences lead us to constrict and shrink ourselves, both physically and psychologically. Mate says that until we work it through, it constrains our capabilities and generates an enduring distortion of our view of the world and other people. It keeps us stuck in the past, robbing us of the present moment's riches, limiting who we can be. It fragments the self. It blights our sense of self-worth, poisons relationships and undermines appreciation for life itself. So we become disconnected from ourselves and we embark on a search for safety and belonging in places we will never find it. Peter Levine emphasises this when he defines trauma as being about a loss of connection to ourselves, our families and the world around us, leaving us diminished in some way, more limited than before in a way that persists. We might be able to see patterns in our thoughts, our words, our actions that link back to feelings of unbelonging. In a powerful uh, Haven Courtyard workshop led by Marika Vepsalainen, we looked at over-empathy and how many sensitive people learn a survival strategy of trying to soothe, solve, regulate and balance the emotional energy in social situations, in relationships, in other people. We all learn early on in life more and less acceptable emotions to show to the world around us, to the people around us, especially in those nurturing, formative environments. What we need to do to feel a sense of belonging, safety and acceptance and the things we shouldn't do, say, believe, think and feel uh, in public if we want to fit into our, our kind of core social group. How we respond to unexpected change might indicate where some of this stuff might be hanging out for us. I was reflecting on where we might see patterns of over empathy as reaction to unwanted change, because at times like that, there's often turbulence, isn't there? It's unsettling. There's a lot of uncertainty. And so if we are uh, in an environment where people rely on the outside world to kind of manage and regulate their emotional energy, for example, they might lash out or project or become helpless to the point where they expect uh, and demand somebody else to pick up the pieces for them. We might have learned to do exactly that, not necessarily for their sake, but for ours in order to feel safe and balanced. We might learn that our sense of safety and belonging is acquired through this over tilt into empathy, into solving, soothing, helping, healing, balancing, regulating, whatever you want to call it. And this might appear through uh, people pleasing or an overt sense of responsibility for the well-being of others, where we might feel responsible for other people's feelings. We, might, we want everyone to be happy so that we can feel safe. It's not real safety, though. It's just a perception of safety. It's a temporary fix, and it probably won't last long. We might feel a sense of guilt when things go wrong, even if we have nothing to do with it. When crises happen, it can feel like it's our fault. And the patterns we might notice in the face of those unexpected changes could be a tendency to smother. You know, we might go into over fixer mode, over tending to addressing um, the, the problem, sorting things out, focusing on the needs or perceived needs as we see them or the, the need for people to need things um, where we seek to solve the rupture, the loss, the change by controlling the situation through the pattern of fixing everything. You know, if they're OK, I'm safe. Or if I feel like they're OK, I'm safe. What can I do to make sure they're OK? When we feel overt responsibility for things that are not our doing, we might also become resigned to a sense that it doesn't matter what we do, we are bad and bad things happen because we are bad or whatever the script might say, it tells us that things went wrong because we are here. These are all scripts of unbelonging. They assume that if we weren't here, things would be okay or that we can acquire belonging if we make everything okay. They also allow us to avoid looking at our own feelings and seeing the impact of the unwanted change on us. You know, we build a wall to that stuff. Maybe you've done this to yourself or you know people who tend to do this. They might express their feelings through um, other people. They focus fully on other people's experiences of um, of a, a, a situation so that they don't need to think about their own processing of it. So they use other people or even 
things like animals um, or inanimate objects as a filter to share their own emotions. This can happen if we've learned that certain feelings are not acceptable for us to feel. Maybe we were told not to cry growing up, for example, and we subvert that story for others, telling, if not demanding other people, you must be sad, it's okay to cry, don't bottle it up. And we think we're talking to them, but really we're talking to ourselves. Or when someone has been to stay and we're disappointed that they're leaving, we might say, oh, the dog's really going going to miss you. Look, you, you can tell you're going, he's really upset. And this might not be about the dog at all. It might actually just be our way of saying, you know, I'm really sad that you're going. I'm going to really miss you. But that can be a massively vulnerable thing to say directly. So we use the dog as a sort of go between. Um, I noticed this a lot in my years working as an undertaker um, in the face of grief, which is one of the most profound and painful experiences of change. Some people Uh, would express their own feelings by projecting onto others. They would look to soothe and to heal and to help, imagining that the other person that they're with, like other other mourners, uh, was feeling what they weren't allowed themselves to feel directly, the the story that they'd internalised about what they were and weren't allowed to feel, Um, which can be kind of weird and annoying for the other person because they're not allowed to feel their own uh, experience of grief. Um, And they're kind of used as this sort of proxy for the person to offset their own grief through. And you you see this underpinned by phrases sometimes like, I'm sure you must be feeling such and such, or it must be really hard to see such and such, Um, rather than asking what they're actually feeling or saying, you know, what's going on as you look at that. Um, And I think this is probably something we all do to a certain degree, this sort of level of projection of our own feelings onto other people. Um, And and you you see it with with sort of closed questioning, um, assumptive questioning. Um, And I think this underpins a sense of disconnection from our our self, like within ourselves and from others. We might be uh, split from our gut feelings and our intuitive knowing, a sense of disconnect from our place within our body and our mind. Again, this self-unbelonging that comes when everything seems um, separate and in competition or in conflict. Um, you know, last year when we discussed the themes of change and belonging in the Haven, we talked about uh, this, this word integration was there quite a lot. Uh, this idea of things becoming part of the whole rather than a bunch of separate things making up the whole Um, a bit like the image of an ecosystem which is a bunch of organisms that become kind of melded together they don't just influence one another they aren't just there um, side by side they're kind of created through communion with one another they are changed through their integration with each other you cannot then remove one organism without fundamentally changing that and changing the entire ecosystem perhaps even in destroying the whole thing and so self-belonging is is understanding how everything integrates together from our internal physical mechanisms and processes our emotional experiences and our outer world activities relationships and so on everything is integrated everything flows and it can feel scary to kind of even acknowledge that, let alone let it happen, to allow ourselves to be changed by where we are, who we're with, how we're feeling, what we're doing, what we need, and and what we realise is important to us. All of these things flow through and into and around one another. Holding these things with gentleness means allowing them to influence, infuse, inspire and impact us while firmly holding the core truth of ourselves and our existence, that we belong before we do anything. We don't need to change in order to belong, but we are free to change because we belong. When I released my single Sleep It Off, I wrote a blog post about unwanted change and collective grief. Uh, Unwanted and supercharged change seems everywhere. It seems rife at the moment. The rate of change is crazy. It touches everything. Um, And I was thinking about our relationship with change in terms of the stages of grief Um, which I think can really help us as we uh, reflect on deep processing and what deep processing means and and how we can make uh, create the conditions for it in our lives. And one of the core aspects of deep processing is permission, allowing things to do what they need to do in order to integrate into our being. This is where the absorbing part of change comes in and where 
we don't hold space and give permission for processing. We find destructive reactions and unhealthy responses. I wrote, grief is a head in the sand. When we are confronted with unwelcome change, our first reaction is often to deny it. It's almost impossible to absorb and adapt to something we don't want to be true, so we seek for information to help confirm our preferred truth. We rationalise irrational thoughts and pretend that this is normal. Funny as it sounds, it's actually a healthy part of the process. Rather than confronting the brutal truth in one hit, we can gently adapt to our place in the new reality. But it does us no good to stay there. Grief is a slap in the face. According to David Kessler, co-author of On Grief and Grieving, anger is pain's bodyguard. It's how we express pain. He describes it as an anchor that gives temporary structure to the nothingness of loss. In the face of profound change or deep loss, anger provides a temporary sense of control over feelings of hopelessness and powerlessness. We might direct this to other people or groups. We might point it at the thing that is changing or has changed. Or we might turn it on ourselves. We apportion blame, seek vengeance and become black and white in our thinking. If we are unaware of the impact anger is having, it can become destructive in our lives. It does us no good to stay there. Grief is a loose knot. In the aftermath of unwanted change, we might go over our past choices. If only I'd done it differently, we might think as we negotiate with superstition or a higher power in an effort to retie the shredded knot. We plead with the powers that be to help us make things right. This gives us a sense of hope, the feeling that there was something we could have done differently. And we might tell the story of that alternate reality, the history that would have unfolded had we voted in a different way, made another choice or stayed at home that night. We might channel our grief into symbolic acts, changing something about ourselves in the hope that it will bring back what we've lost. It provides a temporary sense of hope, but it does us no good to stay there. Grief is a black hole. At some point, it becomes clear that the unwanted change is here to stay. The painful realisation of loss. When there's an acknowledgement that we can't return to the place we long for. It might feel like this is the end of the road, like there is no future. We try and imagine what comes next, and all we see is an empty space. But this is a part of the brave steps required to allow the future to make itself possible. This is a deep sadness that comes to terms with the irreconcilable desire to return to normality. Grief is a road marker. Acceptance is not the same as rolling over and giving up. To accept unwelcome change is not to be happy with it. Acceptance doesn't mean we're okay with what has happened. And it's not a destination where we're magically healed and made whole. It's like a mark on the carpet, a scar on our body. It invites us to remember something meaningful, a story about a moment of life. We don't get over the loss, but we come to terms with it. Psychologist Sherry Cormier says coming to terms with grief is not about moving on, but rather learning to integrate change into our lives so that we can move forward with a new reality. She says it's sort of offensive to grievers to say, oh, you've really moved on. No, I don't think grievers move on, we move forward. And finally, grief is a source of hope. We might move into what Kessler writes as the sixth stage of grief, meaning. Based on Viktor Frankl's work in Man's Search for Meaning, in which he recounts the horrors experienced in Nazi death camps during World War II, this stage is where we're able to transform grief into a peaceful and hopeful experience. This final stage appears to be a product of deep processing when we allow the experience to integrate into our being and it's no longer that raw wound. The word healing means to restore to wholeness and while the word restore might imply a sense of returning or going back, I think healing is more profound because healing never goes back to the same state as before. There's always something changed, something added, something let go, something different. The wholeness is an integration of the experience to absorb it and continue onwards within a new landscape. The sight of the pain, the loss, the rupture isn't filled. It's not replaced. It's accepted. Healing after grief is about allowing what is not there to be not there 
and for that to be part of the landscape going forwards. We're not healed when we try to fill the hole with something else. That's where the scar tissue comes from. We want to numb that area, fill it with a distraction, use other people to soothe our pain and so on. Healing is about accepting the whole, H-O-L-E, within the whole, W-H-O-L-E, and allowing that to be part of who we are. In a conversation I had with Bill Allen, author of Confessions of a Highly Sensitive Man, he talked about highly sensitive people having a wider aperture for sensory input. And like on a camera, more information flows through the lens when that aperture is open wider. And if we don't make space and time to process the information, it kind of just filters through, floods through, flows in um, and stacks up as noise. And this is why highly sensitive people uh, get overstimulated more quickly as well, especially if you don't have those uh, rhythms of deep processing in place. So how do we process all this information? How do we process a fast changing world? How do we process the events going on around us and in our lives and in the world more generally? And what about these things are we processing exactly? At its most effective, uh, deep processing happens at different levels. You know, we're going to have hand like practices that help us pr- uh, process things in a more conscious and hands on way. Um, you know, the, the, these are kind of overground ideas that I'm going to talk about in a second. And also underground habits and activities, things that go on without our conscious uh, meddling, I suppose. In reality, there's kind of a mixture of all of these things happening and that there's going to be, uh, again, integrations and, and interweaving and rhythms like that that are going on um, like at, at all of those levels when things are feeling good. Uh, our conscious processing infuses our unconscious processing and our unconscious processing influences our conscious thoughts. There's a famous quote that says, thoughts disentangle themselves when they pass through the lips and the fingertips. Our thoughts can be overwhelming at times. When they're allowed to roam free in our minds, they can become noisy and difficult to, to kind of unpick and decipher. We have an initial thought and then a second thought and a third thought. We go back and forth and end up in a confused mess of overthinking. At least I do, I don't know about you. And those proverbial lips and fingertips help open up the depth of processing. This is how we make sense of things going on around and inside us. You know, I find journaling, as an example, a really helpful way to do this. It allows me to take an experience or a situation or an event, ask myself what I'm thinking and feeling in relation to it. Um, and I find this a good way to, to process ideas as well that I've uh, read or heard in books or come across, or listen to in podcasts, training sessions, conversations. Try writing down the core things that I've taken away from whatever it is. <laughs> it's amazing how often I realise, yeah, I, I either can't remember the thing that I think I know about uh, or I haven't formed a clear picture of understanding of this thing. Um, so writing sort of disentangles the confusion and paves the way for a, a more uh, concrete picture or a, an ability to recall what it is that I'm trying to uh, internalize or learn. It's the same with speaking. You know, trying to explain something to someone else is a great way to, uh, to kind of uh, get whether you understand something simply. Uh, it's also just a great way to process your understanding of it. it. Helps kind of chip off the fluff around the edge and and kind of drill down into the core of whatever it is. Overground processing is something we can do through habits. You know, making time to write, having a structure to that writing if needs be. Same with speaking. You know, it might be actually you just free form conversation is is, is really helpful. It's what you need. Um, or it, or we might need to kind of carve out time for a more structured conversation to really uh, make time to talk about specific things, um, you know, especially when those things are, are maybe a little bit more difficult, difficult topics to broach with people. So it's sort of, yeah, you, you kind of meet up with someone and that topic gets pushed down the, the field and you never quite get to it. Um, I think this is one of the great values of a, of a coaching conversation, for example, or the structure of coaching. When you have a specific challenge or issue that you're working through, um, a, a question based coaching session can really help process thoughts and feelings and reach a point of clarity about um, you know what you can let go and what you can focus on, what it is that practically you're going to do, um, take action on. Um, just helps really practically um, like work 
situations and experiences and, and events through with ourselves, um, using that other person as a as a way to sort of um, kind of structure that and and form those thoughts in our minds, to recognise the things that are still alive within us and to process them as well. You know, there might be things that we thought we'd got over, things we thought we'd buried, uh, things that we had buried, um, but things that still you know, are actively kind of pulling the strings in ways that we um, seem to, to act today. And again, we, we notice this in the patterns that we might see in the way that we react to things uh, or in certain parts of relationships and stuff. It's like, that's happening again. That's interesting. There's still something within me that I need to process, that I need to kind of figure out in some way. And so overground processing can help us acknowledge that we always have options to pick between as well. It helps us build a, a collection of potential avenues that we can go down when we face uh, maybe similar things in the future, things that we want to take from other experiences and say, OK, right, that's going to go in my toolbox so that when something happens in the future, I, I can remember this this moment and I can uh, use what I've learned here to make a create a better outcome or, or create a better avenue through that um, it's a way to increase response flexibility which is what psycho analyst rollo may defined when he said human freedom involves our capacity to pause between the stimulus and response and in that pause to choose the one response toward which we wish to throw our weight the capacity to create ourselves based upon this freedom is inseparable from consciousness or self-awareness so overground processing helps us know where it is that we want to throw our weight and to pick between options to throw our weight in that direction. And this helps us more quickly filter options and make choices that fit, fit that those kind of deeper visions and values that we hold for our lives. Without processing, we're kind of more likely to be at the whims of our survival strategies and the reactions that we talked about earlier, the things that we create as a way to keep life safe rather than meaningful. So what about underground processing? The deep processing happens like the processes of breathing and our heart beating without us thinking about it. There are things that we can do to make each breath more effective and to regulate our heartbeat, but they are mechanisms that work when we're not consciously thinking about them. Deep underground processing is about creating conditions rather than doing anything active. We have the in-between experiences that we might recognise, the aha moments in the shower or while we're out walking, when we're not thinking about something directly and suddenly we know what we need to do. It's like, ah, yes, there it is. Creativity and play can be sites for these moments too, when an idea or a thought might suddenly pop into our head while we're focused on some, something completely different. Underground processing happens as our inner world knits threads together and connects dots that we would never put together through conscious thought. This is why I think free writing is a really powerful idea. You know, Julia Cameron's morning pages, focusing on the quantity rather than the content of what you write, um, just to say, okay, I'm going to, I need to write six pages. Um, doesn't matter what I do and it doesn't matter if I feel like it or not, I'm doing it. It doesn't matter what comes out. I'm not going to review it that it's just irrelevant. It's a kind of form of unconsciousness raising where we give space and permission for the unconscious to speak. For me, uh, music and songwriting is, is a, a big part of this deep processing as well. You know, the way that I write starts from a, a very intuitive and free foundation. You know, I kind of sit at the piano or guitar and allow a song to reveal itself before I, I then go into a, a more kind of conscious crafting, editing, construction stage. And this is why songs often uh, show me what I think or feel um, before I have kind of words to describe that. And it can give me something to, to work with and to, and to focus on as a process. The more we make space for deep processing, the quicker we can become at then filtering and selecting options and making decisions and, and kind of intuitively going with things as well. And as we practice it at both underground and overground levels, we can begin to learn to trust ourselves and to go with our flow. When we first think about this stuff, especially the, the kind of making space for uh, for underground processing we can we might sort of in, have a, an all or nothing mindset with it 
we believe like I've got to make loads and loads of space. I don't have anything like enough time and space to, to allow this processing to happen. But actually, it might not require much at all. The truth is we're under so much pressure from stimulation and we're chronically starved of stillness and silence in our modern world. We feel this demand to be productive, busy and useful, which makes it really hard to allow conditions for deep processing. It might feel like we need to make massive amounts of downtime, but actually it's really about the quality and the conditions of our downtime that matters more than the time itself or the amount of time itself. I had a, an amusing moment of awareness earlier this year when uh, I went for a long walk after a busy morning and I was listening to Elaine Aaron's Highly Sensitive Persons Complete Learning Programme uh, as I was walking. And she was talking about the fact that highly sensitive people often uh, don't actually need a lot of downtime for deep processing. Uh, I think it was around sort of if, like 20 to 30 minutes a day can be enough um, to allow the, the inner world to settle and, and and be as it regulates and calms. And she talks about sort of taking a walk or lying in a calming room. And she said, you know, doing this without any sensory input, not listening to or reading or watching anything, switching off the noise from the outside world. I suddenly realized, um, cause I kind of, I, I was on this walk thinking I was like decompressing. I was like, I, I'm going to listen to, to this audio book as I go. And I suddenly realized how hard I found that, you know, I could have the downtime of the walk, but I wanted to be listening. I wanted to be learning. I wanted to be making it useful in some way. And so I noticed my mind buzzing and ideas swirling around, you know, even this very idea that had entered my mind, I was like, oh man. So so this is really unproductive, uh, unhelpful, unhealthy. Um, me listening to this as I do this, this is like pointless having this walk. Um, and so I realized that was the processing that that kind of took the place of the processing that was needing to be done. And it sort of, all of that had to be put on hold while this new information came barging through the door and I was now working through this. And so I ended up to like turning off the audio book and taking my headphones off and just walking like slowed right down. Uh, and I was just tried to, to be mindful as I was going, it, like really wasn't easy. My mind was, was buzzing. I was like, had this sort of tension that, this is a waste of time. And I realized that I often use input like uh, an audio book or a podcast when I have downtime. And that in actual fact, a very little genuine input free downtime. So I began practicing that, you know, 20 minutes after lunch, nothing, no input, just lying down or, or walking without any agenda. Um, it took a while to get comfortable. There was quite a bit of sort of like, okay, I'm feeling unsettled about this. I'm feeling like I, sh I need to be doing something useful with this. I need to, like, the, there are things I could be doing at the same time that would, you know, <laughs> and all of these thoughts. Um, but eventually I was, I started just giving myself permission for that and working with that and not fighting it. Um, and I felt clearer and more energized and more peaceful. Um, but it's pretty impossible to measure the benefits of, of making space for deep processing in this way as well. You know, you can't really pin a cause and effect to it. That's why it's, it's harder to motivate ourselves towards creating conditions for it because, you know, according to the judgments and the values of the world at large, space and downtime for processing might seem wasteful and unproductive. Like, especially as, as you look at someone kind of making time for that, like even when you're relaxing, you should be doing something. Um, or like it should be meditation, like that's okay. Um, but what if it's just like, just sitting, doing nothing, not meditating, not doing like whatever it is that you, that you need to do for that, uh, for that deep processing to occur. How much downtime do we really need if the downtime we create conditions for is truly downtime? Processing happens when we create those conditions and trust that's all we need to do. What happens when we don't make space for deep processing as individuals and as a society, when we don't allow ourselves and others to feel what we feel and need what we need? Well, I'd suggest it's what we see all around us today, urgent dread stacking, catastrophizing, feelings of anxiety, hopelessness, resentment, disconnection, fragmentation, disintegration. This happens for us as a collective when we don't process things together. 
I often wonder about this. I was interested to see, you know, what happened in uh, here in the UK after the Queen died. Um, it became as close to a moment of collective uh, kind of deep processing than I've ever seen. You know, whatever your beliefs about it all, there was this, this kind of symbolic moment of deep processing. There was an overground expression as people talked about their thoughts and feelings about it all and stuff. And there was something underground as well, demonstrated by the queue to see her coffin lying in state. There was this sense of a pause for those who waited, you know, best part of 24 hours, moving slowly towards the front of this queue. Is pilgrimages processing using an external object like the queue or the queen's death as something through which internal processing is allowed to take place. It's kind of given this, this structure to happen. And there was a collective unconscious processing going on during that period too. Whatever that was, I'm not sure uh, fully yet. Maybe, maybe it will become clear. I don't know. Um, but I guess I wonder how we make space for these collectively like this these collective moments of deep processing when everything moves on so fast when we're all so disconnected we're all atomized how do we deeply process this crazy journey we're on together so that we move with that kind of healing that we talked about earlier integrating the holes left by the losses we incur together allowing the whole to function without trying to fill or eradicate the holes uh, h-o-l-s uh, h-o-l-e-s left by our wounded history and fragmented past, but by accepting them as part of what we are becoming. As individuals, when we don't do deep processing, we don't heal. We might even keep picking at the wounds that we recognise, that we're aware of, and sabotage the healing processes because we're focused directly on seeing if it's fixed yet. You know, I used to do that with scabs when I was a kid. You'd pick them off, head back to square one. I always just enjoyed the feeling of picking off scabs. Um, or we think we need to get involved in the healing process itself directly. We sabotage progress by trying to heal. But it's like trying to play, trying to sleep, trying to create, trying to relax. Trying to heal is something that never leads to the desired outcome. The path to play, to creativity, to sleep, to relaxation, to healing. Far harder, but simpler than reading another book, doing another course, downloading another app. They require us to get out of our own way and to trust that things will happen once we stop forcing, once we stop controlling, once we stop gripping so tightly. Deep processing has gradually uh, integrated into my coaching approach as well. It's something I've intuitively used without realising, I think, um, and I've recently become more consciously aware of how I can create conditions in coaching for deeper processing to take place for me as a coach and then for those that I work with as well. As you'll know, if you've been following what I do for a while, The Haven is uh, the membership community that I founded um, as a safe and private space for, for people to explore their gentle, rebel, quiet, creative, playful and thoughtful selves. And a few years ago, I identified nine core themes that we would look at each year, the same nine themes year on year. This was underpinned by a, a kind of awareness, a sense of the power of deep processing through rhythms and cycles and seasons. This kind of sense of liturgy going back through the same things, repetition. While the themes are separate, they also connect in all sorts of ways. I, like I've explicitly linked change and belonging in this episode, but I think other themes like creativity, strength, serenity, inspiration, they're all easy to point to in the way that they weave into what we're talking about here as well. The idea is that rather than trying to understand everything that we can about a theme, we just open space for the conversation and allow the ideas to speak and to germinate within us and through us. It's a beautiful way to invite deep and meaningful growth as we uncover new desires, discover new ways of approaching old things and build friendships along the way. Deep processing can't be rushed or forced. It can only be allowed, released, given permission. So that's what we do. I was also inspired to bring deep processing uh, into my approach to individual coaching as well, inspired by my conversation with Annie Schussler um, uh, a while back, uh, where we talked about sort of asynchronous coaching um, and this idea of, of having um, conversations through time so uh, like 
some some question whether it's um, uh, the client sending a video message to me and then in my own time I respond through my through a video message back um, and actually I've I've kind of created a combination of different things because I think the levels of processing are really important in the conscious and unconscious stuff uh, so I've been combining a mixture of sort of live calls along with um, bespoke reflective questions so after a live call I'll, I'll come up with some questions for um, somebody to to just reflect on uh, to to then share their responses back with me by writing them down and sending them or recording them um, in their own time and sending them back to me and then I'll do a video response to those so they can sort of uh, have that in in their own time and kind of go back and watch it again um, and then from there we, we go back into another live call and so by bringing in a mixture of rhythms and different forms of engagement, it allows the mind to connect dots and creatively engage with these desires and challenges and goals that are being worked on. Um, and it kind of brings it into different levels of our being uh, and it makes fertile ground for breakthroughs and aha moments to occur at any, um, any moment along the way. We do the conscious processing in the live sessions and then open up the conditions for deep subconscious stirring between the calls um, and so this mixture just provides a great oscillation between the the different levels of processing and like i was saying when we engage deep processing conditions and habits things can go quickly you know we might suddenly have intuitive flashes where ah i know what to do um, i know exactly what i need to do with this now um, we might have reflexes that speak truth that we haven't thought about and we might find ourselves moving in a more meaningful direction without needing to weigh it up, without needing to overthink this thing. It's like, no, I just know. I just feel this this awareness that this is the right thing to do. This is the right way for me to go. Like when we process, absorb and integrate unexpected change into our lives, we can be prepared to be unprepared for what we can't see coming. It requires us to be patient with ourselves processing can take time and it doesn't always seem like anything is happening just because we can't see results it doesn't mean there are none think about the seasons the cycles the life cycle of um, particular plants and trees they look in the winter like they're dead like nothing is going on but that's all an important part of what is to come we surrender to what needs to be processing can't be forced and gentleness processing requires flexibility and creative openness it requires the ability to see a selection of options that we can take um, in the in response to any uh, given situation in front of us we're not defined by the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves those scripts that we might have been running until this point gentleness is about being able to flex to move to have that firm back and soft front there are things we can do to bring a sustainable consistency to the conditions and habits of processing but it's important to remember that we're creating conditions so we are prepared to respond to and flow with and maybe even instigate the unexpected and spontaneous moments of life to be mindful of being open to the unexpected twists and turns positive and negative and everything in between that present themselves to us Learning what we need in order to process deeply and sustainably is a personal thing that requires a lifetime of exploration, learning and nurturing. Let's enjoy the ride. All right, that will do us. Uh, if you've enjoyed this episode or got something from it, um, please do share it with others who you think will find it helpful. Uh, get in touch with your reflections through the website, andymort.com, uh, and come and join me on social media and in the Haven. Uh, and most of all, remember that even when it appears not to be, gentleness is always an option. Bye bye. Just one more thing quickly before we finish. Because you're listening to this, I imagine you are a reflective person with a caring, creative and compassionate spirit. And I want to just quickly tell you about The Haven, which is a virtual village for quietly creative misfits just like you. Whether you're looking to build lasting friendships with other gently unconventional people or you simply need some respite from the world's noise right now, I've built The Haven 
for you. With its cafe, theatre, library and fireside, it's a calm bubble of support and encouragement for gentle rebels. It's currently the autumn season in the membership and we're looking at the themes of change, belonging and serenity during September, October and November. Through our conversations in the community as well as resources like the private podcast feed, videos, interviews and short courses, we dive into these themes and ask how we can build healthier, happier and more connected lives in sync with our natural, gentle rhythms. Perhaps you know intuitively that there's so much more within you waiting to burst into life but maybe you don't quite know where to start or how to bring it out in a way that feels good to you. Well, I'd love to welcome you in and show you around The Haven. You can learn more at the-haven.co or you'll find a link in the description for this episode.